evening. Woo! I like to hear that. Greet someone. How we doing? Facebook, happy to have you with us as well. Good to see you, youth. And uh, let's all just stand together and open up in prayer before we get started here. God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your house. And Lord, we just first off start this time with thanksgiving, Lord. We thank you that we are in your house right now and that we can worship you freely, Lord, and that uh, we are free because of what you've done for us, Lord. We just thank you for that, first and foremost, for your grace and your love and what you've done for us on the cross. And God, I just pray that as we worship you tonight and we get in your word, Lord, that we would just be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Lord. I pray that you would just use, use the word that uh, is given forth tonight, Lord, to just uh, give us something special that we could leave here changed. So we just thank you and love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said... That we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story.
him some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
as Pastor Cindy at the beginning of the service, some research I did uh, today on Gaza. And she handed back, handed it back to me and says, you share it. <laughs> so there's three places of scripture that basically speaks to Gaza. And that's in Ezekiel, Jeremiah 47, the entire chapter, and Amos uh, chapter 1. And I wrote these down with a slight commentary. Uh, Gaza is the area that used to be occupied by the Philistines. Uh, so Ezekiel 25, 15. Thus saith the Lord, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for old hatred. It was destroyed. They sought to destroy from an old hatred. They were not provoked into this. Uh, it was an unprovoked attack against Israel. Amos 1, 6, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away punishment thereof because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. Gaza would take hostages in this attack, which they have. Amos 1, 7, but I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. Many buildings in Gaza are going to be destroyed from counterattacks. Uh, Amos 1.8, and I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod. Ashdod was a city there. Um, uh, and it mentions a couple others. In other words, many people are going to be killed and many will be displaced. Uh, going back to Ezekiel 25.16, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out uh, mine hand against the Philistines and I will cut them off uh, the cherithims and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. Sea embargoes cut off supplies along with sea attacks. Ezekiel 25, 17, and I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. They are going to suffer massive losses. There's going to be great revenge. Jeremiah 47, the entire chapter is to Gaza, but verses 1 and 2 reads, the word of the Lord that came unto Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the, the north and shall be an overflowing flood and shall overflow the land and all that is therein, the city and them that dwell therein. Then the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. From their north, Israel is going to evade and come under, uh, come against them with sea attacks and ground attacks. Jeremiah 47, 3, at the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, and at the rumbling of the wheels, the fathers shall not look back to their children for feebleness of hands. Ground attack with tanks and other vehicles when it speaks about the rumbling of the wheels and chariots and so forth. Uh, in Islam, they give up their sons uh, to death and dying to honor their God. In Christianity, God gave up his son uh, to save us. Quite a difference. Um, Jeremiah 47, 4. Because of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines and to cut uh, off from Tyrus and uh, Zidon. These are two cities in Lebanon. Uh, every helper that remaineth for the Lord will spoil the Philistines. In other words, they're not going to get any help from Lebanon. Now, Hezbollah has fired a few rockets, but, you know, just uh, I think they'll see that it's useless. If they do attack, it could open the door for the fulfilling of Psalm 83, which in, will involve other nations in the whole Middle East. Uh, which could happen very quickly. We're in the last days. Things are going to start moving very, very fast. Jeremiah 47.5, baldness has come upon Gaza. In other words, they're going to devastate uh, the, uh, the Gaza Strip there. Ascalon is cut off, which is a city there with the remnant of their valley. How long wilt thou cut, uh, thou, uh, cut thyself? An overwhelming loss of property. Now, one thing about heathen gods, they worship gods like if you remember in the days uh, of Elijah, they cut themselves uh, when they were often, 
this is a form of their worship. They're going to be crying out to their God, and your God's not going to help them. God's defending Israel. He always has. Jeremiah 47, 6 and 7. O thou sword of the Lord, how long will it be ere thou be quiet? Put up thyself into thy scabbard, rest and be still. How can it be quiet, seeing the Lord hath given it a charge against Ascalon and against the seashore? There hath he appointed it. The people of Israel are going to be looking to the Lord to bring judgment against Gaza because of their great losses. So th these are some scriptures uh, concerning Gaza uh, for these days. Our obligation as Christians is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem uh, from Psalm 122. I'd like us all to stand and let's pray for the nation of Israel. You know, when Jesus in Matthew 25 says, as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Who's he talking about? His brethren. He's talking about the Jewish people. He divides the sheep and the goats. We're the sheep. We're the sheep nations. And then there's goat nations. But he's saying to the sheep nations, you know, just uh, uh, do, do goodness and kindness to the least of these, my brethren, the Jewish people. So let's join our hearts together in praying for Israel. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the miracle of Israel and how you've raised them up in the last days. And Jesus pointed of, to this as a sign that he would be coming soon. When you see Israel begin to flourish and blossom as a fig tree. And Lord, we're instructed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we ask, Lord, that you would place an hedge round about this city, Lord, and about this country, and that you would watch over your chosen people. Lord, that your name will be glorified throughout all the world. For over and over in Scripture, even when these things occur, it's so that the heathen may know, that they may see that the God of Israel is the one true living God, and that he loves his people and cares for them and protects them. We ask a supernatural uh, hedge round about Israel at this time and that you would draw near. Comfort their uh, suffering during this time. And we pray for the people of Gaza that their hearts would turn toward uh, the true and living God. And Lord, that uh, Hamas would find no place of refuge in their place any longer. That the people's hearts would turn to the Lord. And Lord God, as we understand that we're living in the last days, we pray for a mighty move of God over all this world and that you will be glorified. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. Let's remain standing. There's some needs tonight. Ruth Bennett's daughter-in-law's brother, Sherry, some of you know her. She came. She was in the choir until she fell and broke her ankle or leg. I can't remember which, but her brother had an accident and he has to have surgery tomorrow. So I ju we just want to lift him to the Lord. Continue to pray for Kathy, Janie, and Al. And the list goes on, but let's just pray. I gave my word that we would pray for Jim tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray right now that as he goes into surgery tomorrow, Lord, they said that muscle is ruined in the eye, but God, we know you can repair it. And Lord, we stand on your word believing tonight that you will minister. And I pray, God, as they decide what they have to do as far as all the bones go, Lord, you know, and you can bring them all back together, all in alignment of the way in which you created him. And so, Lord, we lift him to you tonight and just ask that you be with the surgeons tomorrow. Minister and move and touch on his life and his heart and his mind. God, we pray for the family that you would wrap your arms about them. And, Lord, we pray tonight for Kathy. We ask that you will continue to touch her. Minister to her, God, we pray. Emotionally, mentally, physically, Lord, just wrap your arms about her. Lord, we pray for Janie tonight and Elle. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would move and touch and minister. For Jackie tonight, God, touch her. Lord, we pray that you will draw her unto yourself. And Lord, I pray right now that you'll be with Sue and you will touch her and minister to her as she sees her daughter going through all of these things. We pray tonight that you will just minister 
by your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that we have health and mind enough to be in your house tonight. I pray for the youth and the children, God, that you will minister to each one and that you will be with the leadership that will be ministering to them and give them the words and anoint them, Lord. We thank you. We give you all the praise and the honor, Lord. I pray that you anoint our minds that we understand, our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our heart to receive, and our hands and feet to do and to go. Lord, we thank you tonight. We praise you. We continue to lift up Marilyn tonight, strengthen her body, minister to her, and be with her. Lord, everyone on that list, we just ask that you will just minister to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just look at somebody and say, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Good evening. Is this working? All right, great. You can't hear me? They'll take care of that. There we go. Good evening. We are so excited um, to begin our journey on in the books of First and Second Peter. And Pastor and I over, we aren't sure exactly how long we're going to be in these books. We want to dig in. And just really ask the Lord to move in our lives. And we're going to be working together with this. And I have the privilege tonight to just kick us off. So before we start, let's just pray one more time. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is applicable to our lives in every area. And as we embark upon this journey to study your word, the the letters of First and Second Peter, we ask God that you would prepare our hearts and the hearts of each person that will be plugging in and a part of this study, that you would work in us, that you would change us, that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us, and that you would work in our lives. We love you and we thank you. And everyone said together, amen. amen. Well, right now, most of you, all of you know, I think, in here that I'm not where I can stand to teach. So, and if I'm down there, they say that they're not going to see me on Facebook. So I feel a little awkward, but I'm up here, and um, we're just going to get started. A couple months ago, Pastor passed out a survey. Do you all remember the survey? And she just asked some questions, like what you wanted what you enjoy as far as upcoming studies, and it was a resounding majority that people that you guys love and want to study books of the Bible. Um, there were some other things checked, but that was definitely heavily weighted, <laughs> and um, that was what you guys said, and also that you like someone to be teaching you and to have some discussion. So that's what we're planning on doing over the next several weeks, couple months, more than that. We just don't know. So, um, But we're excited to do that. So tonight we're just going to lay a foundation. We are not even going to jump in to 1 Peter tonight, but we are going to lay a foundation to become prepared for this study. Is that good? All right, great. We want to encourage you to do a few things during this study. And throughout our journey of First and Second Peter, there are four specific things that we are going to ask you guys to do. Number one, and you see it up here, is be praying. And we want you to be praying that the Lord will use this study in your life individually, in each of our lives individually, in, in our church as a body, that the Lord will use this time of digging into these books, that he will use it corporately. And that he'll also use it in the lives of those that are plugging in weekly on Facebook. Some are live with us right now, but some click on later and plug in and are a consistent part of our studies. And we just want 
be in prayer. Say, Lord, work in my life through this study. Work in the life of our church through this study. Do something transformational in us and minister to those via Facebook. There are some that join us by Facebook week after week after week, and they are not capable. Wow, here we go, round two. Um, They are not capable of coming. Many of them aren't capable of coming and joining with us corporately. But we hear testimony after testimony after testimony of people's lives being touched um, through Facebook. So be praying. Number two, invite someone to join you. Turn to the person next to you and say, invite someone to join you. Pastor has little invite cards she's going to bring around. She made those up today. And I really, instead of this becoming a bookmarker or something that you just use to hold your place in your Bible or whatever, please, please pray over this invite piece and use it. It may be someone that you invite that is a part of this church that never you never see them at Bible study. Or it may be someone in your neighborhood or in your workplace. It may be a family member. I urge you, this isn't to like, okay, well, so-and-so down the street, they go to this church, but they might want to come to our Bible study. That's not what this is about. We are looking for people that are not plugged in anywhere on Wednesday nights. We want to invite them, especially those that don't know the Lord. Amen? So please, please pray over this invite piece and use it. Use it. Put it in the hands of someone. Say, join me this week, this coming week. We're starting a new study. We want, I want you to be a part of it with me. Maybe someone you see on Sunday morning. Please, please take that seriously with us and put that on invite piece into the hands of someone. So number one, be praying. Number two, invite someone. Number three, bring your Bible. All right, say that with me. Bring your Bible. I love it when Pastor Jeremy refers to this as our Sky Bible. (laughs) And I'm very thankful for that Sky Bible sometimes. But it is so important that we learn our way through this book. And you know what? We will always put scriptures up here. We will read them. Um, You can pull out your phone. But you know what? There are places in the world that relied on this, and those apps were removed, and they are no longer able to utilize that. And that day just may well come. Pastor Bill made very clear how close we are to the return of the Lord and we are in the last days and don't think that the enemy is not going to make it difficult and it is so imperative that this word become a part of who we are a part of who we are and that we can that we learn our way through the word so wouldn't you just love to hear rattling pages as we're going through this study the next couple months We encourage you, bring your Bible. So number one, be praying. Number two, invite someone to join you on this journey. Number three, bring your Bible. And number four, do your best to be here each week. Why? Because we're going to be learning and growing together. Especially when the time changes in a few weeks and it's like 5 o'clock and it's dark and it's cold. And it's like, ah, I sat down and I wrapped up in this quilt and it's 6 o'clock and Oh, maybe just this week I'll just stay cozy. I encourage you. I urge you. Be here every week. If you're not well, that's understandable. If there's something going on. But really, do your best to be here and be a part of this journey week after week after week. So there we go. Be praying. Invite. Bring your Bible. And be here. Be here. In the letters of First and Second Peter, there are only eight chapters combined. There are five chapters in First Peter and three in Second Peter. But wow, <laughs> as I've just been reading over the last couple weeks again through the books of First and Second Peter, there is so much that we are about to dig into. And I just want to quickly, and I want to encourage you to start reading now. You can't read this too many times over the next couple months, the books of 1st and 2nd Peter. I encourage you, read it and read it again and read it again 
And as we apply it to our lives, the Lord is going to change us. And but over the next few months as we are in this series, we are going to be talking about Christ as our living hope. We're going to be talking about how believers, how we as believers, followers of Christ, are called to live lives of holiness. How we are truly called to live lives of holiness. We're going to talk in upcoming weeks about suffering for Christ. What that means, what that looks like. What those that are experiencing that right now are going through. We're going to be talking about submission to authority. Everybody, oh, no, seriously. We are going to be talking about what God says about authority and submission to that authority. We're going to be talking about how to endure trials. How to walk through those difficult places, those difficult seasons. We're going to be talking about false teachers. And how many know that in these last days there are many that twist and distort the word of God. And that is why this word needs to be so planted in a part of us that we are not swayed by the false teachers of the days that we're walking in. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about relationships. Not only are we going to be talking about our vertical relationship with the Lord, but we're going to be talking about those horizontal relationships inside the walls of our home, inside the walls of the church, with fellow believers, all of those things. Those are all things we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the return of Christ. And we are going to be talking about far more than what I just said. So how about that? In those eight chapters that we're going to dig into, there is so much. And we are super excited about that. So let's lay the groundwork. All right. Who is the author, very simple, of First and Second Peter? Okay. In First Peter chapter 5 and verse 12, and I know they're going to have it on the screen as well. I'm just going to read it for you. I'm reading tonight from the NIV. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12 says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. So who does it sound like helped Peter? With Silas. And you know what? Many theologians believe that Silas didn't just help, but he probably penned it, and maybe Peter was the one actually dictating it. Does anybody know why? Pardon? Okay, that's an idea. Pastor Bill, what were you going to say? Right, and Silas was well-versed in the Greek and was much more skilled at writing. So uh, many theologians believe that it was actually Silas who helped pen this because, I mean, we see here that Peter testified of the help of Silas, and most likely he had a little more than just a little bit of help. So anybody else, anything you want to say? All right, the date of this writing of First Peter was A.D. in between 60 and 63, approximately, theologians believe. So the date of the writing of First Peter was A.D. 60 to 63, and the date of the writing of Second Peter was A.D. 66 through 68. We're going to quickly see next Wednesday, especially those of us that have spent time and, and read, have read the word through our lives. We're going to see very quickly next Wednesday when we actually jump in to 1 Peter that the tone and the content of that letter is very consistent with what we already know about Peter. <laughs> and it, it really is. And I want to just make a side note there. And I know everyone in here, and I know that many of you have been students of the word for years and years. But we never want to assume, and we will not be assuming in these upcoming weeks. And I just want you to understand this. because, And I wish I had an invite piece in my hand. It's not necessary. But these invite pieces that we are going to hand out, and trusting that some of those are going to go into the hands of people that don't know the Lord, that maybe haven't read the word, 
but maybe just through life they've, you know, maybe heard some of the stories of the Bible, some of the big names of the Bible. Probably many unbelievers, you could say to them, where did Jonah spend three days? But many of those people, if you said, well, why, would be like, oh, I'm really not sure. Um, or, or some people, if you would say, in the Bible, they talked to someone and their name was Doubting. But they might not know why he was referred to as Doubting Thomas. Or the disciple that Jesus loved. But someone that hasn't studied the word and known the word might be like the disciple that Jesus loved. What, he didn't love them all? Do you see where I'm headed with this? The walls of what came falling down when they marched around it seven times? And many Even unbelievers know these stories just because maybe even in studying literature in their early lives, they maybe read some of these stories. So just know that if there are times where you are like, wow, they are over explaining this, it isn't all about us. Because as we're handing out these invite pieces and we're saying, here, neighbor that doesn't know the Lord, I want you to come. Just know that that neighbor might need a little bit of that background information because they weren't in Sunday school hearing all the big name stories and understanding all of those things. So please understand that in upcoming weeks, that as we see, and we see it right now with what is happening in our world, that Jesus is coming soon. We need to seize every opportunity every Sunday, every Bible study, to see people come to the Lord. So we never want to assume that everyone in the house has read the word. Even some of us that may have been Christians for years and years have maybe never really become students of the word. And that is my prayer for each of us over the next couple months. I know it's been the prayer of pastor that we will become students of the word. Students of the word, not just like, all right, pastor's up there, I'm going to listen to her. But that we will take it and we will dig in. And we will, we will dig into the word and study it. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That we may know and understand with the help of the Holy Spirit, his word. So just know that at times, the things that seem like maybe simple to us, like everybody should know, the person right next to you just might not know that. It might be something they are hearing for the very first time. As we are starting to look at these letters, tonight we're just going to take a look at Peter. Because, you know, if... Someone sends me an email, and it's someone that I don't know, or they send me a letter, and I really don't know them personally. I can't really totally hear the tone and grasp what is sometimes being said. Did you ever misread a text, even from someone you're close to? But especially when you don't know someone, it could be like, oh, that email or that text or that letter. I'm not quite sure how to take this. And that's why we're just taking tonight, and we're going to just take a look at Peter. Who was Peter? What do we know about him? What does the word say about him? What were his experiences? Because if you know the person that wrote you that letter, you can better grasp its meaning than if you were receiving it from a stranger. So tonight we're just going to get to know Peter a little bit better. Let's first, we're going to look together at Mark chapter 1. And I know it's up there, Mark 1, verses 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. This is where we catch our first glimpse of Peter. 
And he was called by Jesus, of course, as we see here, to be one of the disciples, along with his brother Andrew. Now, it, as you see what the word says, it says, at once they left their nets and followed him. Do you ever have someone ask you to do something and you're like, oh, maybe a little hesitation. I'm kind of intrigued. I want to do this, but I'm not. The word says that without hesitation. Now, we have to understand that these men were involved in a lucrative fishing business. They, they were successful in that way. Here they were. They had this lucrative fishing business in the Galilean city of Capernaum. And all of a sudden, boom. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. We could interpret this reaction in different ways. We could be like, whoa, they were overly enthusiastic or maybe overly impulsive. But once you get to know a little bit about the Galileans, maybe you begin to understand Peter a little bit more. So we're going to talk about that, Simon Peter's immediate response. And in fact, it was the response of all the Galilean disciples that Jesus approached. They responded to him, and they followed him. So let's take a look at what we know about the Galileans in general. Have you ever heard of the Jewish historian named Josephus? Okay. One time, he, he, okay, first of all, he was a general in Galilee during the first century. He described the Galilean temperament as this. Ever fond of innovations and by nature disposed to changes and delighting in seditions. Doesn't sound like just this mild manner, right? William Barclay, the Scottish theologian, and I believe that is up here, notes quick-tempered, impulsive, emotional, easily roused by an appeal to adventure, loyal to the end. Peter was a typical man of Galilee. You know what? Sometimes we, we picture Jesus going, and he goes to Simon Peter and Andrew, and he says, you know, follow me. And we picture them kind of like, oh, all right. We'll follow you. But when you, when you think about the Galileans and what their nature was like and that these were, they had a lucrative business and they were fishermen, they weren't just kind of like, oh. They followed him. And when you get to, when you think about what their temperament was like, it puts a whole new light on it, doesn't it? Because they weren't just like, we don't have anything else to do and we're just kind of, well, he told us to come and, you know, we, we know he's like, like, they responded. They responded to him. If we look at Peter's response, it gives us a p picture of his adventurous abandon. So I want you to envision Peter that way because that's the way he was. He was obviously adventurous. He obviously, he responded to the Lord. Now, keep in mind, this does not at all discount the teachings of the Lord and that he had heard Jesus preaching. It doesn't discount that Jesus had a compelling personality and that when he went to them, it doesn't discount the power of God that was empowering Jesus as he called those disciples. It in no way discounts that, but we do see Peter's adventurous side. And we don't often think about that. There are certain things that we think about when we think about Peter, and we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. But Peter's role among the disciple was actually one of prominence. He was actually, he had leadership skills. He might not have been the greatest to write the book, but he had leadership skills. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 2 says, these are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Now, I'm going to read verse 2 again. It says, these are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. That word first in the Greek is protos, which actually means the first. 
Now, we know that they were called together. The scriptural account tells us that. And although we saw that in the account in Mark chapter 1 that we already looked at, and we know that he and his brother Andrew were called at the same time, many theologians believe that in this passage, first was in prominence, but not in order. And, and we see, as we start to take a look, and we're going to, Peter quickly became the spokesperson for the disciples. He quickly did. He was bold. He would step forward. He would ask the questions that no one else wanted to ask. Do you ever sit in a class with someone else? I, I remember just a, a month or so ago, I was sitting in a class, not here, but somewhere else, and there were questions, and I even said to Pastor the day before, I'm like, I want to ask this question. I'm going to ask this question. Like, I want to know the answer to this question. And Peter, he would often be bold and step forward with questions that nobody else would ask. If you look in Matthew 15, 15, and I know there's a lot of turning but um, it will also be up here. Matthew, Matthew 15, 15. Peter said, explain this parable to us. He was the one. He was the one that said, you know, and you know the disciples, they all had to be kind of wondering, well, what did exactly did that mean? But Peter said, explain this parable to us. And then if you just move ahead to Matthew 18 and verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Here he was again, gathered with the followers, but he was the one. I want the answer to this. I'm going to ask this question. Go ahead to Matthew 19 and verse 27. Peter answered, them. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? Peter asked the questions. He asked the hard questions. He very quickly, after being called and starting to walk and follow Jesus, kind of became the spokesman for the group. So we, we start to learn his personality here. And isn't it nice as we're going to be starting into the books that he authored to kind of know who he was in, his, in the walking with Jesus. We even see examples in scripture where those on the outside inquired of Peter in regard to Jesus. Matthew 17 verse 24 says, And Jesus and his disciples arrived at Capernaum, and the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? So they're even approaching Peter and saying, so you see where we're headed here? Peter was, he had, he was a spokesperson. He, there, he, there was almost like he was a leader. Um, we also see in scripture that Peter could be, let's say, maybe a little reckless in his loyalty. He even got reprimanded by Jesus. If we look in Matthew 16, I'm going to start with verse 21. And this was a serious reprimand, I might add. Starting in verse 21, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So we see here Jesus, he could, or Peter, he could even be a little reckless. Like, hey, no way, this isn't going to happen to you. Peter's great zeal led him to make promises that he could not and did not keep. Do we remember what those promises were? What did he tell Jesus? He said he never would, right? Matthew 26. And I'm going to read it. Matthew 26, starting with verse 31. Matthew 26, 
Then Jesus told them, This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen and I will go ahead of you into Galilee, Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. It wasn't that he didn't want to. It wasn't well-meaning. It was because of the power of his flesh that when the rubber met the road, what he had promised, that promise he couldn't keep. And he didn't keep. It was because, as I said, the power of the flesh without the enabling power of the spirit that he couldn't. Peter denied Jesus. Matthew 26, just later on in that chapter, starting at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. But you know what? In spite of his failures, we are about to see that God used Peter in an amazing way. And as we look in the book of Acts at the sermons that he preached, in spite of his failures, and we need to be encouraged by that. Because no matter where we have been, no matter what we have done, failure is never final. We sing a song and one of the lines is, failure is never final when God is in the room. And you know what? Failure is never final. Sometimes we're like, you know what, I am disqualified to be what God desires for me to be because I did this, 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 and this. What does that mean? If we truly believe that, his death was useless. What he did for us was purposeless. If he could take someone like Peter who walked ever so closely with him, saw his miracles, heard his teaching, saw lives transformed, saw things that no one even knew were possible, be possible. But yet, he just denied him. Blatantly said, I don't even know him. If God could use Peter... There is not one of us, there is not one of us that he cannot use. Failure is never final, and Peter's life is a perfect example. Be encouraged by that. And be encouraged by this. I'm going to read Mark 16. Um, I believe it's going to be up here too. Mark 16, let me go there. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Mark 16, verses 1 through 7, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? 
But when they looked up and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. In Jesus' darkest hour, one of his closest friends, his followers, his companions, turned his back on him. But after a victory and he has risen, go and tell his disciples and Peter. Not go tell the rest of the disciples except Peter. Now we know which disciple is missing in this group. And it is not Peter. Who's missing in this group? Judas. But go and tell the disciples and Peter. That should encourage my heart. That should encourage your heart. No matter how bad we mess up, no matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter the wrong choices that we have made along the way, failure is never final because of him. Peter experienced up close and personal with Jesus. So as we dig into first and second Peter, we get to hear from one who walked right with him. We get to hear from one that experienced his miracles. But we get to hear from one who experienced grace and mercy. And we should be encouraged by that. I am so excited to continue on in this study. And I think it is the best way to go into it is just grasping Peter for who he was. Kind of brash, not really well with his speech per se little rough around the edges. Jumping in, asking all the hard questions. But now he pens, maybe not literally pens, but authors the book that we're about to dig into. And may we, we think about that as we head into it. Who's writing this book? And that, I mean, obviously, it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the book was written, of course. But the one through whom which it was written knew him personally, walked with him. Messed up, messed up horribly just when he needed to be strong and couldn't. Have you ever needed to be strong and couldn't? think we all have. So pray as we get ready to journey into this study. God use this study in my life, in the lives of our church, in the lives of the people we will be inviting. Invite, and I don't know if I'm saying these in the right order, but invite someone to come along on the journey with you. Bring your Bible, bring your Bible What's that? Bring your Bible. And I just totally lost the last one. Do your best to be here each week. You don't want to miss it. I know you can catch up on Facebook too. But really do your best to be here each week. So, Pastor, will you close us? Peter's my kind of guy. <laughs> How many times have I put my foot in my mouth? Me too. But how many times did Jesus 
He was one of the three that always went with Jesus where Mount of Transfiguration, on and on we could go into when others were healed. But how about the time when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And what did Jesus say to him then? You could not have gotten this on your own. And then it was a couple of verses later that Jesus turns around and says, Satan, get behind me. So Peter goes from being wonderful and, and then Satan get behind. Isn't that just like us? Man, we're in there. We're, yeah, we're doing great. And all of a sudden we're slapped upside the head because we messed up. I'm excited about these books because it talks about everything. It talks about false teachings. It talks about Jesus coming back. It talks about so much. And a lot of it is what we're going through today. You know, if we each handed out a card and maybe half of them decided they would come, how many more seats would be filled? These are words that we need to get out there. I told you Sunday, I believe it was, we can't just be sitting around. So if it's going to be cards I'm going to put in your hands, it's going to be something. We're praying for revival. We want revival. You know where it begins? That's right. Yep. Father, we love you tonight and we thank you and we praise you. We honor you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it remains. We thank you that we could stand upon it knowing that you will come through because it's your word and you're not a God that lies. And Lord, we thank you for that tonight. I thank you for each one that is here. I ask that these next few months will be a blessing will be a learning time. But Lord, I pray that as we take those in our hearts, that it will change us, transform us, make us new, and that others will know that you are Lord of our lives and thirst and hunger for it. Those that are watching by Facebook, those that are here, Lord, I pray your hand upon them as they go home tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be team teaching. On what that looks like, I don't know. Um, we may split the evening. It may be her one night. It might be me one night. But we're just, we're just going to rip apart the first and second Peter and see what it has for us. Thank you for being here. God bless you. Have a good rest of the week.